Happy Leap Day evening, everyone. It's 21 News Chief Meteorologist Eric Wilhelm, and it's the Valley's most in-depth weather forecast video on this Thursday evening. It's the final hours of February, the final hours of meteorological winter, and let's talk about the final numbers, and we're going to go long on this video to talk about what happened over the winter and our spring forecast as well. So buckle up. We've got a lot to get to this evening, but real quickly, we'll just run through the numbers for today. A rare, cooler than average day, 36 and 22, the high and the low today. So a rare blue box on this graphic. Uh, 29 days in February, and we had what? Three, six days that were cooler than average in terms of high temperatures. Uh, for the season, for meteorological winter, 78% of our days were warmer than the average when you combine highs and lows and get a daily average. And this will go into the record books as probably the third warmest February on record. Uh, the final numbers aren't uh, quite baked in just yet. We'll see what the temperature gets down to this evening. But uh, yeah, for all intents and purposes, uh, a top five warm February. We had a top five warm December and uh, the second warmest winter overall on record. A little bit of business to clean up still from our uh, severe weather yesterday morning. We told you yesterday about all the tornadic activity back towards Columbus and Dayton along Interstate 70. Well, there was one more tornado that was confirmed by the National Weather Service today. This time it was the Pittsburgh office that confirmed this. They had a, a tornado in their area that uh, touched down uh, in the wee hours of the morning on uh, Wednesday. And this was cleared out in southeast Ohio, uh, southeast of Cambridge, south of Interstate 70. This was in Monroe County, and this was an EF2 uh, tornado, so uh, another strong one. Um, the uh, sustained winds were the uh, winds estimated in the in the tornado about 120 miles per hour at 7:25 a.m. during Wednesday morning. Just a weird time of the day to have a tornado, really any time of the year, but especially in early February. All right, the clouds and the flurries that we had this morning, long gone. In this afternoon, the sun broke out. We've got a crystal clear sky overhead this evening. And after that cold air mass got flushed southward, it's being replaced quickly off to our west. 24-hour temperature change numbers, 20 to 30, almost 40 degrees warmer than the same time yesterday out across the Midwest. And we've got a big jump coming our way on Friday, first day of March, featuring sun in the morning, clouds in the afternoon. And then it looks like we will get wet in most spots starting around mid-evening Friday, taking us through the you know, overnight. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had a couple of raindrops still out there early Saturday morning. I think we may see some sun before Saturday afternoon is through, although that's uh, debatable. Uh, I think there can be some clouds from time to time into Sunday morning, but I do think Sunday afternoon will be pretty nice with a big jump in our temperature. So weekend forecast looking like this, 52 on Saturday and 65 on Sunday, and the warmest weather as is yet to come. That'll be here early next week. We're talking almost a record on Monday. The record is, uh, what is it, 74 on Monday? 74, 1983. Um, but uh, our forecast right now is 72. That's 31 degrees warmer than the average. And yes, it is going to cool off towards the end of next week, but not back to average, still above the average. I do think that the middle of next week can be unsettled with a few rounds of rain in the uh, forecast. All right, let's talk longer range. We'll get into uh, the winter review and spring forecast. This was the uh, finalized March forecast from the Climate Prediction Center issued today uh, for temperatures. Uh, warmer than average month favored pretty much everywhere east of the Rockies with the exception of the Southern Plains. Now, I think this could be a, a month that's really split almost in half. The first half of the month, I think, is looking pretty darn mild, if not warm. Second half of the month, if you've been following my longer range thoughts of late, no surprise that it still looks like the second half of the month could feature a pretty decent pattern change. Now, in terms of precipitation, not a real strong signal in our area. It should be wetter than average down in the southeast and from San Francisco to Denver along uh, Interstate 70 and 80. Um, for us, I could see it kind of being somewhere in between. I don't think it's especially dry. I don't think it's especially wet, though, during the month of March. All right, let's talk more about the longer range. And well, first, before we get to the spring forecast, Let's review the winter. Here's the calendar view of the uh, winter season through a couple of days ago. We don't have the last couple of days on here in February, but you get the idea. December, very warm. We had a stretch in January of about eight days. That was actually pretty cold, but that was the exception. Um, right in the middle of meteorological winter, it got, actually got cold. Um, but after that, once the cold was flushed out of the system, end of January and much of February, very, very blowtorchy, not only here locally, but throughout most of 
the eastern U.S. All right, so when we look at the stats, the warmest winters on record, we uh, snatched second place. About 36.1 was our average temperature last year. The fourth w warmest winter on record at 35. So we were a good degree plus warmer than last winter. And of course, last winter was very, very warm in terms of February. Again, I think we probably finish right here, although we'll maybe adjust this, uh, or I should say right here, we'll adjust this as needed with the finalization of today's numbers, but either way, it's gonna be in the top five. And look how many recent Februaries are on this list. I mean, it's been remarkable in February since the middle of last decade. Uh, 2017, 2018, 2023, 2024, all occurring in this uh, you know list of warmest Februaries in just seven years. We've had four top 10 warm Februaries. All right, so the winter forecast. Uh, we issue these seasonal forecasts uh, every early November. Previously, it was kind of in late October. We've pushed it ahead to early November so we can digest the latest computer model information that comes out right at the start of, of, of each month. And we put these forecasts out. We update them in early December. Um, this year, we didn't really make too many adjustments to that forecast in early December, about a month after the original original forecast was issued. Here's a look at the December forecast. That's this right here. And then if you scroll down, this is what happened in December. It was a pretty good forecast. Now we were pretty confident in that December forecast because all signs pointed to a warm start to meteorological winter and that's what transpired. January was also a pretty good forecast um, from a national standpoint. Uh, we ended up three plus degrees warmer than average here locally. Uh, we weren't quite warm enough kind of in this zone. But in general, we had the general tenor of January right across much of the lower 48 states. Cool out here, <clears throat> warm in the northern tier. And again, we weren't quite warm enough in our part of the country, but we didn't have any sort of bad forecast in January. Where things went sideways, of course, was in February. The February forecast, uh, you know, most signs pointed towards a cold February, um, com especially compared to the previous couple of months. Of course, that did not happen. This was, you know, a almost finalized look at February, just almost the reverse of our original forecast. And how did that happen? How how did we bust that bad? Well, that's first of all, that's the nature of seasonal forecasting. Yeah, you know, occasionally you're going to have uh, some periods that don't work out as planned. But you know, in reviewing the data, you know, I kind of think that we missed a signal uh, when it comes to what was going on in the Pacific Ocean. Now we had El Nino, of course, and I went through an explanation a little bit. Uh, what I'm showing you actually this evening is on my weather blog, ericwfmj.com. This is the text version of what we're discussing on this video this evening. And in this blog post, I talked about how, yes, it was a very strong El Nino, but we thought it wouldn't necessarily behave like a really strong El Nino because of other factors in the oceans, especially in the Eastern Pacific. Well, as it turned out, it pretty much behaved like a strong El Nino during the last month of the season in February. When you look at the total analog set, all the years that we used to come up with our winter forecast, including February, um, the signal was colder for February. But amongst those analogs, there were a few years in which February was warm, and those happened to be some of the most recent really strong El Ninos. Uh, the last strong one, 2015, 2016, 91, 92, 82, 83, 97, 98. Uh, this is kind of the who's who of really strong El Ninos over the last few decades. When you make a composite of those years, you get a warm look. Turns out that was the right idea. We were fooled a little bit by uh, thinking this wouldn't necessarily behave like a strong El Nino. Uh, this was our you know, percentage chances of certain outcomes for the winter season. We ended up down here. Uh, we only gave it a 5% chance of it being that warm. And well, that's the way it turned out. In terms of snowfall, again, not a great forecast. We thought it would be probably quite a bit snowier than last winter, but still below average. It's certainly been below average, but it hasn't been much snowier than last winter. It has been a little snowier, but not by a big margin. And so this is what I'm kind of giving us as far as a, a grade, uh, these different aspects of the forecast. Uh, colder than last year, uh, not really. Uh, pretty close to last year, actually. Um, so that gets a D. Below average snowfall, you know, this is kind of an incomplete forecast because the last flakes have not fallen, but for all intents and purposes, it's a middle of the road forecast. Um, you know, we didn't call for a super snowy winter, so at least there was that, um, but we uh, did not expect it to be as uh, lacking in the snow department as it has been. Temperatures, we're going to give that forecast a C. Uh, snowfall, here's a look at some local uh, observations from what we call Kokoros observers, uh, people that uh, 
uh, take observations each day, upload that data to the internet so we can all have access to it. And some pretty paltry snowfall numbers at the airport. We've seen over 20 inches, but it's pretty common in most of our area with some exceptions to be in the teens in terms of snowfall. All right, let's look ahead to the spring season. Um, here's a look at what we're using for analogs for the spring forecast. March, April, and May. 2020, 2016, 2005, 98, and 2010. When you make a composite of all those, this is the map you get. Um, maybe somewhat warmer than average, but pretty close to the average in our part of the uh, country. Um, now, you may be a little bit surprised that we don't have a warmer forecast or at least a composite look uh, with these analogs, given how warm the season's going to start. I do think that early March is looking pretty warm, but April and May, maybe not so much. Here's a look at the composite map for April, showing the warmth continuing in the upper Midwest, but eh, kind of a neutral signal here locally. And there's actually pretty good model agreement that May may be, you know, not exactly what spring warm weather lovers would expect uh, or like. Uh, May may not be all that warm at all. So, you know, overall, it comes out in the wash as probably a spring that's a lot closer to the average than the winter season was. In terms of precipitation, and this becomes important, of course, at this time of the year, um, since, you know, it's spring and, and people want to plant, and not only just gardens, but of course, agriculture, getting things in fields, um, that becomes very important in the spring and summer season as the growing season gets underway. Here's a look at the uh, analog composite for precipitation March through May. A little bit of a dry signal from the Mississippi Valley up through the Great Lakes. Now, it's not a super strong signal, and I don't think the, s the spring is likely to be super dry. But hedging my bets, I would say it's, it's drier than wetter. Um, it may end up being pretty close to average, but uh, you know I don't expect a super wet spring. I think it's more likely we have a pretty darn dry spring than a very wet spring. Already the ground is fairly dry. Here's a look at the, uh, the uh, soil moisture in the, you know, kind of the top layer of the, of the ground. And it's pretty dry across a lot of the Great Lakes and into the Ohio Valley. It's not going to take much dry weather in spring to put us into uh, an abnormally dry situation or perhaps even a drought. Um, and I do think that one other thing we'll be watching this season is a late season frost and freeze potential. When you look at the date of the last 32, on average, that's usually in early May. Now there's some variation. Last year we didn't have our last 32 until May 18th. Some years it's in late April, but you know there's a lot of May dates on this list. When it comes to a hard freeze, temperatures in the uh, 20s, the average date of that last hard freeze is April 25th, but again, there's some variation there. I do think there's an increased risk this spring of a later than average frost and freeze, maybe even a hard freeze deeper into May given what uh, history has shown us in these kinds of situations in the latter portions of meteorological spring. All right, so putting some percentages on our outcomes for the spring season, uh, we do think temperature-wise, you know, we're not going to we're not gonna go crazy on the extremes here. We think this is more than likely going to be reasonably close to average temperature-wise with about equal chances of being below or above by a smallish margin. We don't think it's all that likely to be at the extremes. Um, now, I know we said that about winter, but uh, I, I, I do think that this is uh, you know pretty likely for the spring season, that we're going to end up in this three-month period being pretty close to average. A warm start, maybe not so warm compared to the average as we head into April and into May. In terms of rainfall, now we do have slightly higher percentages down here at the bottom for this. It's not as symmetrical as the temperature forecast. We think that odds favor it being at or below average in terms of rainfall during the spring season. Um, now, it's not a huge percentage, but, you know, it is a uh, it is something that we think is a little more likely at this point. Uh, we are heading into La Nina, it looks like, during the second half of this year, and we can speculate a little in this video and on this blog post about the summer season. That was kind of our bottom line for spring. We'll take a minute here and just talk about summer briefly. Um, one season at a time is usually what I say, but, you know, let's speculate a little. El Nino is fading fast as we speak, and we're going to head into La Nina, uh, we're almost certain, as we head into summer and fall, and that's the opposite of El Nino, and La Nina is actually what we've been in frequently in, in recent years. This El Nino that we had this winter, an exception. We had three straight La Ninas before that, and it's all about, of course, the waters in the equatorial Pacific, and they're going to cool off pretty quickly as uh, we go into uh, the summer season. And how quickly that occurs, how fast La Nina comes on, is probably going to be a big player as far as the tenor of our summer weather, both in terms of heat and moisture. A faster onset of La Nina brings a risk of a drier summer into the forecast. 
if we end up having a dry spring, if we have a dry summer too, that's not great news. So uh, if you're you know, rooting against excessively dry weather, you hope La Nina doesn't come on hot and heavy this summer, it waits until the fall. If it is a little more of a slow process, then we have more chances of you know, getting enough rain during the growing season. As far as our analogs go in the summer season, here's a look at the precipitation map. And again, there's a, a dry signal around parts of the Ohio Valley and especially along the East Coast. Um, but again, that depends a little bit on the speed of La Nina coming on. We're gonna have a lot more to say about the summer season as we get a little bit closer, of course. I do think there are risks that it's a pretty darn hot summer, especially compared to last year, which wasn't really hot at all. At all. I think, it, I think there's some risks there of it being a hot summer and a dry summer. Um, you know, here in, on the last day of February, we're not going to be super confident in that, but I think there is some risk given what happened in previous years where El Nino was fading to La Nina. During that transition, there have been cases where we've had a pretty darn hot and dry summer, and so I do think that that is a risk this time around. You can read up on everything we just talked about, ericwfmj.com. That's my weather blog. Thanks for watching this extended version, director's cut, if you will, uh, of Weather for Weather Geeks on this Thursday evening. Happy Leap Day, everyone. I'll see you back here on March the 1st on Friday.